The next kind of memory corruption vulnerability that we're going to look at is the idea of a heap overflow. So a lot like a buffer overflow, uh, a heap overflow occurs when data writes beyond the bounds of a heap. Now remember that um, dynamically allocated data lives on the heap, whereas you know the stack tends to be for our you know our local variables, return addresses, things like that um, inside of our stack frames. Um, so typically, the stuff that we tend to see in the heap, you know, like dynamically allocated arrays or objects, things like that. And the heap lives at lower memory addresses and sort of grows upwards towards the top. Um, most often, though, the representation of a heap in an OS is as a linked list. And that's how um, blocks of memory are sort of tracked and allocated as either being, you know, assigned via dynamic allocation or are free for allocation. So that, for example, is the struct. Um, that sort of represents a allocatable dynamic memory chunk out of Linux. So, you know, it's got a size for this chunk and pointers to the previous and next uh, allocated block. So in a heap overflow, just like a buffer overflow, the attacker's um, goal is to write beyond the bounds of a single allocated chunk into an adjacent, um, hopefully allocated piece of memory in this linked list and sort of corrupt the contents that are in there. Um, trivially, you know, you might be able to, to overflow into an adjacent value and maybe change the address of some uh, or the content of some, maybe some local variable. You might be able to change the address that a pointer is pointing to because oftentimes maybe a heap holds a pointer to a function somewhere, right? We might imagine that, you know, a dynamically allocated object on the heap has pointers to functions um, that it then dereferences to execute functions. There might even be dynamically allocated functions that live in the heap as some languages are capable of that. So um, for that reason, some of the memory protections that we've talked about earlier might not necessarily be available when we're talking about heap overflows, because you might actually have to have um, executable instructions permitted in the heap because of, of dynamic allocation and things like that. Um, but there's nothing saying we can't implement some form of like a heap canary. Um, ASLR also works with heaps. So again, the, the exact location of things might not be known. And we're going to look at an example of a simple heap overflow, but beyond those, there are also other types of heap um, data corruption vulnerabilities that we uh, are not going to look into um, because they're pretty technical and a little bit beyond the scope of this. But ideas like um, a double free or a use after free vulnerability uh, take advantage of things like garbage collectors and the idea that, you know, we might be able to put... Um, data into a previously deallocated chunk of heap memory via a heap overflow where it's then later referenced after something has been freed. So I might call a function on an object that I had freed earlier and forgotten I'd freed. And in the meantime, someone's been able to overflow some other heap chunk into uh, the heap that was previously allocated to that object. So if it's later called, um, we have more opportunity to maybe overflow and corrupt its data. But we're just going to look at a basic heap overflow example right now to hopefully kind of illustrate the point. Okay, so um, we've got heap overflow.c here and a make file. Um, the make file is the same as the one we've been using all along. And here's the contents of this program. So we have uh, just a few imports. We have two constants, buffer size and oversize. Um, we have a, a diff variable that's an unsigned long and we have two buffers each of which are dynamically allocated to be buff size bytes and typecast to characters, uh, character arrays, so basically strings. And each of them we can see has a length of 10 because they use buff size for their allocation. Then we take sort of the name of this pointer and convert that to an unsigned long. Essentially this is going to give us sort of like a memory address um, in a format that we can perform calculations on. And then we're going to do that to the other buffer as well. So we're going to subtract Think about it this way, we're going to subtract the memory address of buffer 1 from the memory address of buffer 2. That should, in theory, give us the distance between these two in terms of a number of bytes. And then we're going to print that difference to the screen. Then we're going to fill buffer 2 uh, with the character A. Okay, so since it's 10 bytes in size, we're going to fill it with 10 bytes uh, worth of A's. We're going to print that uh, contents of buffer 2 uh, to the console. Then we're going to use memset to copy the character B into buffer number one. And the number of times we're going to copy that is going to be sort of dynamic based on how far apart these two buffers are in memory. 
right? So we're gonna take oversize, which is five bytes, plus the difference uh, that we de uh, determined between these two buffers. And that's the number of Bs that we're going to write. Okay, so we're basically gonna start writing into buffer number two. Um, we're going to sort of fill up all of the um, buffer two plus the distance between buffer two and buffer one and an extra five bytes. And then we're gonna print out the contents of buffer two after we have done this overflow. So in theory, what we should see happen is since buffer one is being filled past capacity and more with the character B, we should see some of that leak into the content of buffer two. And then we just free the two buffers in return. Um, typically though, this program is gonna crash. So we're gonna run make to build this and we're just gonna run it. So initially this, the gap between the two is about 16 bytes. Or the, the difference between the starting address rather is 16 bytes. So buffer two uh, before the heap overflow is just full of a bunch of A's as we know. And then after the overflow, after we've written um, probably 16 plus five, which would be like 21 B's into buffer number one, we see that a number of them have overflown into buffer number two that's also sitting on the heap. And at that point the program breaks and crashes um, after we try to free them. So yeah, uh, that's the really simplistic basic buffer over or heap overflow. So like we saw with buffer overflows, uh, where well, there are a couple of mitigations that might work again, we can kind of invent the concept of a heap canary, or we could use something like ASLR so that at least the location of things in the heap aren't necessarily predictable. But as before, the only real fix is to just make sure that um, bounds checking is incorporated whenever there's heap um, manipulation occurring. So either using, you know, safe stir copy operations or just making sure that, you know, uh, you've used some kind of function of a library that will do bounds checking. And that's it for heap overflows.